the first time we were in the West End and I was just like, and there's like four floors of people and I'm like, everybody just see me naked right now. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just like, oh my gosh. The, the biggest struggle I had at the beginning of that journey was accepting love, um, which is for me the basis of this relationship. If, you, if you're an independent artist, you, naturally you're an entrepreneur, but also you are an artist. And I think a lot of the time we think about how do we get out there? How do we sell it? And not enough time on actually making sure that that product is, uh, is actually good enough to go out in the first place. I'm Claude Williams, and this is a Behind the Dreams podcast. Today we're thrilled to have Ryan Calais Cameron, the award-winning playwright of the critically acclaimed play for black boys who have considered suicide when the hue gets too heavy. Ryan is also a talented actor and director and has worked on high profile projects such as Luther and Queenie. As the founder of Nouveau Reef, Ryan supports emerging artists of colour to build careers in stage, television and film. Join us as we learn more about the man behind the art. Thank you so much for coming on my podcast today. Thank you. Stuff. So, I had the pleasure of seeing your play. Uh, and in all honesty, and when I say your play, I mean for, for Black Boys, boys yeah. um, on this occasion. And it's amazing. <laughs> no, it really is. It's really <laughs> outstanding. I took my mum alongside with me to, oh, wow. to go watch it. Oh, and wow. it was such a unique experience in terms of being able to see really yourself on mm -hmm. stage, see someone that represents so many of the... I guess experiences and like almost explain it. So I was able to talk to mom about this shows all the things that it's like to actually be a black man in London. Yeah, 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 so yeah. thank you for seeing something so beautiful. Thank you for coming, man. <laughs> I know you've seen it. That's wicked. You said you put something on that almost exposes your heart, yeah, your life, yeah, your experiences yeah, yeah. for yeah. an audience of at this point for tens of thousands of people, yeah. if not significantly more. Yeah. Where did you get the strength to be able to be that vulnerable? Um, for me. A lot of it was in the process. I think a thing that I have, so in 20, full 15, I gave my life to Christ. And I think that was the beginning of a, of a, of a journey into vulnerability. And I think the, the, the biggest struggle I had at the beginning of that journey was accepting love, um, which is for me the basis of this relationship. Uh, and going, you know, it's, it's, it's in the play going, I, I don't believe that I am worthy of that. You know, it doesn't mean, I, I don't believe that I'm worthy of that in a relationship. Um, uh, Definitely not from a from from a higher being from God uh, or in any aspect of my life. I'm okay being the underdog and I'm okay being rough and and hardened. Um, and once you start accepting the love of God, it does. It's transformative, right? It it, it exposes you. It holds you. It it lays you bare. Um, and then I think the the next part was having children, having sons specifically, and seeing how my life and surroundings had got me to this hardened exterior in the first place and going, okay, if, if we're talking about love now, how how do I then put myself in a position where they don't have to go through that, where love from God, love from a man feels quite natural to them from the day dot, you know, and I can't be talking to my children in any kind of way if I'm not prepared to put myself in those positions and, and become vulnerable. And then also being married. Um, you know, it's easy if I'm if I'm in a relationship, and uh, I'm making a phone call across town, and how you doing? Yeah, I'm doing cool. I can I can I can I can play that position. But when you are living with someone, when you are sharing a room, a bed, a life, do you know what I mean? When you become one flesh with somebody, there's nowhere to hide. So being able to be uh, naked, uh, especially the way that society conditions conditions men to never be able to show that level of vulnerability to a woman, that's the worst thing you could ever do, and having to to face that on a day-to-day -day basis. So everything is a work in progress, you know. If I look at myself now, I can go, yeah, I'm vulnerable to a certain extent. But uh, I felt like, yeah, that that was it, a, a decade-long process in itself from uh, Christ, children, marriage, um, and then going, okay, I'm going to write this piece. And then even when I've written it, I'm now going, are you really going to put this on? 
um, and being able to hide yourself in the rehearsal process because I've got my director's cap on and I'm, I'm, I'm working, I'm working. And then the first night you actually see it and you go, oh my gosh. And that adrenaline during comes off and you're like, whoa, there's eight, well, Apollo was 900. Uh, I remember the first time we were in the West End and I was just like, and there's like four floors of people and I'm like, everybody just see me naked right now. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> it's just like, oh my gosh. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I think, I think even to put it on, up until that moment, it wasn't about me. Up until that moment, it was like, surely, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Other men must be feeling certain aspects of this. Um, and if not, then I'll run away and we'll never do this again. <laughs> 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 but there was an immediate and an urgent outpouring uh, that compels me to to continue. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Yeah, I don't think I knew how explosive it was going to be. Yeah. 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 One of the things that you touched on is this idea around not being feeling worthy to feel loved. Yeah. And I think that's a really universal experience for a lot of men. Yeah. What are your thoughts on where that comes from? Um it's a, it's a it's a major kind of societal condition, you know. I feel like for men it's like you can be loved, but it's conditional. Yeah. And we hold these conditions. So I go, okay, what are those conditions? Well, you have to be able to provide. You know, I've got brothers right now who are like, yeah, I like this girl, but I ain't on six figure salary yet. So yeah. do you know what I mean? There's this literally 100%. thing of going, if I can't do certain things that society, not the word of God, not anywhere else, do you know what I mean? What society have told me that I need to be able to do, then I, I'm not worthy of the love of this person or anybody else. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Um, I need to, oh, if I'm going to have kids, I need to be able to have gone through this and I need to be able to, it's all these certain types of conditions. Um, which, you know, if I'm talking about my, 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 my journey as a Christian, you know, opening up the word and, and going, none of these, none of these are in, are, are in this. So where did we get this from? And, and, and then looking at not what society says about me, but what God says about me, I think has been the biggest change of my life. And it changed everything. It changed the way I spoke, the way I walked, because, you know, for me, I used to, you know, I'm coming from, South, I look like I'm from South, I sound like I'm from South, do you know what I mean? And I'm going, okay, cool, I'm having to code switch to be in certain situations because the way that I am is not good enough just to be me, right? Uh, and without realising that, you know, we kind of, uh, we, 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 we kind of uh, have this jovial aspect about when we talk about stuff like uh, code switching, but when I really deeped it, I was like, no, that comes from a sense of self-loathing, you know what yeah. I mean? I don't think I'm worthy enough to be me and present me as I am in any kind of context. Um, but when I started to receive this love, I'm going, no, I'm actually created in a certain way, do you know what I mean? Uh, with a certain purpose. God knew who I was, do you know what I mean? Um, so there's a confidence now. And when I go into rooms and I'm, I'm, I'm making business acquisitions and I'm, I'm going, no, I, I I know what I'm about. I know what's in my heart. I know what's in my mind. It changes the way I sit. It changes who I am. Um, so I think that in line with what you were saying. It does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Just in, yeah. And then and then now I'm I'm having you know seeing my sons and allowing them to understand that you don't have to go through that conditioning where you know for a lot of the time I. I'm going through a, a type of imposter syndrome where I'm constantly having to go, no, you are worthy enough to be in this. Whereas you see my children now, they're, they're, they're confident. Sometimes I have to go down a little bit. You know what I mean? it's like mad confident because they never had to go through anybody telling them other, anything other than who they are is, is great, you know? And yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But a lot of the conditioning um, is how we get kind of put into these these, these categories, man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really mindful that not everybody watching is going to be a Christian. They might not have yeah, the same yeah, context yeah, yeah. or some of the things we're saying. So with that said, yeah. what would you say is one of the most important mindset shifts that happened for you when, when you'd had that, I guess, that change in your life? Um, well, for, for what the whole process did is give me a, a self-confidence um, and a shift in identity. Mm. But identity to what? So from what to what? Okay, so from so, if you say to me, okay, you're black, uh, you're working class, you're a man, and you're from London, right? And so automatically, there's a certain glass ceiling that I put upon myself naturally from that from that context. So, for instance, say you're uh, sending me a job, or a job, I'll say a job application, mm. and I'm gonna go cool. They're not gonna hire somebody like me. So, right. so I've already defeated even before I've tried, right? Um, 
Whereas now I would go, or in the last 10 years, I would go, no, I think I can do that. Even if I'm underqualified, I think I can do that. Whereas there are many people in society that will naturally apply for something, even if they don't have the qualifications to do it, because they go, you know what, I want it. And I believe that things work in that way in my favor, Mm -hmm. where I would look at every single thing that, uh, through many different aspects of our society, I have made this kind of image of myself and that is somebody that will not be able to achieve. And then what sometimes what we do as a culture is we, we, we kind of... Uh, we kind of water that and we kind of go, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's best not for you to do that. Oh, yeah, let's stay with, this is what we can do. Do you know what I mean? I think for me, it's, it's about going, nah, cool. Uh, have a mentality that anything that you uh, think of, anything that is in your heart is achievable. You mm-hmm. can achieve it. You just have to find a way, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that kind of mentality changed every aspect in terms of my craft as an artist, but also uh, as an entrepreneur. Do you know what I mean? Um completely blue sky thinking yeah you know and there used to be stuff that i used to say five six seven years ago and it's almost almost in jest because i'm almost embarrassed to really do you know what i mean and and you see those things now in real life and people go so when i say stuff now there's no jest about it it's like okay we believe that yeah we believe that he's, he's the kind of guy that can make stuff happen um so yeah so you've yeah. already accomplished some truly amazing things uh, no, you have. Like, let's let's not let's not downplay it. You've done amazing things, and there's even more in the way. But where are you heading? Like, what's the what's the big picture? It's a good question. Um, this period of my life right now, I call it the mountains, man. Like I've, I, I had a quite a clear journey, like a five year plan uh, of, of of where my career was going to go, and that's kind of done now. And I'm kind of you know I'm in a position where people are offering certain things and. Um, uh, and I'm again trying to align myself and go, okay, what's the vision again? Um, going away, meditating, and making sure I'm not throwing myself at anything. But uh, to continue to be in a position where I am free to create the art that I want to create, mm-hmm. which is so difficult for artists where where we have to add the economical aspect to it. Yes, I don't want to do these five jobs, but then can I afford to not do those five jobs? Actually, yeah. I'm going to have to maybe take one job that I don't really like. But then if I am an artist and I put my heart into everything and I don't even like the job, then what's the point? Do you know what I mean? It's this kind of, but I want to be in a position where, you know, I I can work when I really want to when I and I could use my voice when I really have something to say. So I think that, is the goal and to be able to do it where I want as well, whether it's here, uh, whether it's up north of England, whether it's in the States, in New York, in uh, in LA, I want to be able to really feel as though I can go wherever I need to go, wherever the work feels like it needs to be done. Yeah. Um, yeah, so freedom within my craft, financial freedom, you know, um, is always something that uh, is nice. <laughs> no, it's yeah, nice. Yeah. Having money is nice, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so, so I think, yeah, if you combine those two, I think I'm in. I'll, I'll be in a place where, um, yeah, I'll be consistently in a place where I'll be making some of the best work I, 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 I've been led to make. Yeah, yeah. So what you've just started speaking about there is really touching on something I've been trying to figure out for myself in the future. So as of right now, yeah. I've got no children or any type of okay. like responsibility in that type of way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I also see the vision for my life, similar to what you're saying, being something that's in different places, different yeah. countries yeah. and things of that nature. Yeah. As a man though, yeah. and someone who wants to do fatherhood probably different to what a lot of us saw growing yeah, up, yeah, yeah. how do you balance that where you might be required in other places, yeah. but your family also need you here? This is what we're doing right now. Do you know what I mean? And we're having this kind of conversation every single day. And I, what I love is that my wife and I have thrown away any kind of cultural rule book or anything. And we're like, we're going to find it. We're going to find our way, the way that we're going to find it. Um, because even now, you know, I'm around everywhere. Uh, you know, I just spent a lot of time in New York recently. Uh, where was I last week? I can't even remember. Where was I last week? Somewhere that was not uh, my home. Um, but I'm constantly working away and we found a, a way that that works and the kids actually understand that now naturally um, but even when I'm talking about you know 
the, the future where we might go to live in so and so for a certain place and that and we're constantly going okay well if that's the case could we do uh tutoring at home uh, are there really good schools in these areas and stuff uh and I, I think even in terms of like culture and class and all these kind of things that you know in my line of work i constantly meet people who you know, we'll be going to, to, to dinner or something and they'll read something in uh, in French. And I'll be like, oh, you speak French? No, yeah, I, I spent five years in, in France. I, I lived there. And I, when I go home, like when I, when I mean like culturally to South London and I, and, and I say something like that, people are like, but why are you leaving South for? Yeah. Do you know what I mean? There's this kind of thing where you stay together. This is where, you're, this is where your tribe are and you're safe there. And do you know what I mean? Are you going to that area? Are there black people there? And are you going to be able to get planted there? And do you know what I mean? And this is whole kind of thing. And I'm like, you know what? The world is widening. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's sparse. And I want to be able to go there and I want my children to be able to experience this certain cultures and places and foods, not just from a restaurant or a, or a textbook, mm. but to actually go, no, I actually, do you know what I mean? I know about the pyramids because I went in them. Do you know what I mean? And I, yeah. like, I, I really want to feel like I'm not confined to anything mm. any anymore. Um, so I think that's the, yeah. And in terms of answering that question, I have no idea how we will make it work. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I have, but I think about it daily. And I think, for, for for myself and for my wife, like I feel like in a, in a lot of instances, we're the, we're the first in our family to do certain things. Mm. So there's not even other people to be able to answer. Oh, when you lot went to do, so for a lot of it, it's trial and error. And I think the ability to be able to fail, yeah, right. I think constantly, and again, I think that's another cultural aspect of, you know. In my head, if I go and move my family to New York for five years and I move back because it didn't work out, is that embarrassing to, to have done a whole party, leaving party, tell everyone I'm going and now I'm back because I had to come back, whether it was financially or it just didn't work out. Whereas I know a lot of people in my life now who do that on a day-to-day -day basis, I don't care what anyone else thinks. They're trying stuff out. They got one life. Um, so yeah, it takes a lot of bravery, but yeah, I think that's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah, no, without a doubt. <laughs> I think for a lot of us, if you want to accomplish something different yeah. to what's been what we've seen before, yeah, yeah, we've, yeah. we've got to try some we've new things. Some. Even 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 something as small now, but it's moving out of London. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Whoa. What, what country you are do you know what I mean it's like it's okay man like, yeah. it's okay we're we'll, gonna we'll be fine yeah. but uh, yeah 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 yeah. so bring it back to for, for Black Boys for a second as you might notice I'm always using the shorter version of that title yeah yeah but yeah the long version <laughs> um, obviously includes a word that can be quite heavy for a lot of people yeah. and that's the topic of suicide yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Where, where did that come from and why was it important uh, for it to be I guess in the title of your play yeah I mean Life, a life, man. I mean, considering I, like, I did an interview recently and I said, I don't think you can write a play, a long title uh, for black boys who have considered suicide when the hue gets too heavy. I don't think you can write it unless you've lived it. And I don't think you can write it unless you survived it. Um, and for myself and for a lot of people, that's a, a daily continuation uh, of reasons to live. You know, um, and one of the lines in the play is, uh, um, it's not always, I'm paraphrasing, paraphrasing my own work. Um, <laughs> I think if anyone's allowed to. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it, there's a line between uh, uh, not wanting to live anymore and wanting to die. And I think there's, a, there's this gray area in between that we don't speak about enough, you know, and suicide's, or, uh, or suicide, suicidal thoughts are not always a case of going um, okay I, I, I want to do this at this time and, I, and I'm going to end it today but it's a case of going this life that I've been dealt I no longer want to live it mm. I'm no longer getting out of my bed which turns into a depression that turns into an anxiety and all of these kind of things and I was like that's something that uh, I could slip into at any moment it, it, do you know what I mean like there's certain things in my life that I have to you know um, yeah and I was like I want to speak about that and I think there are so many young men that I know that I can see it in them but they have no way of being able to articulate that feeling do you know what I mean maybe it might be easier for them if they're if, if they if they did actually feel suicidal like hot, a hotline or a forum but what if what, where do you go when you just don't feel like living anymore mm. and you start to see it in people you know they don't take as much care in themselves and they they start there's certain things where they just stop living yeah. um, so for me that was my kind of entry point I was like that's something that I've experienced uh, a lot 
uh, and maybe this can be quite therapeutic and cathartic in a way. Uh, and that was my initial entry point. I never, I didn't know if it was ever going to become bigger than that. But I was like, this is something that, yeah, yeah, might be something. Some other people might have felt this before. Yeah. Yeah. I can say even myself a few years ago, although I haven't had suicidal thoughts, yeah. I have had that experience of, I don't want to live yeah. like, like this anymore. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just like you say, I remember yeah. it got to a point where my dad was like, yo, go get a haircut. Yeah. It's been months yeah. where I just let myself yeah. go, mostly being yeah. in bed, not really even accomplishing yeah. anything. Yeah. And it's almost kind of going back to what we are speaking about of that worthiness of uh, this, uh, should I even be here? Exactly. Like, um, am I doing anything in this world? Exactly. I tried something big, yeah. it flopped, yeah. it blew up in my yeah. face, people got hurt in that process. Yeah. Maybe I'm not actually worthy of this. It's a lot, right? Yeah. And it's that level of heaviness. Like I got to a place where I couldn't physically move or breathe. And it's like, and I think, I thank God for the people that are in my life. Because sometimes, you know, it was a case of going, okay, I don't even see enough worthiness in my life to continue. But there are other people that, I want to be there for your birthday or your wedding or I want to be there to, because I want to be part of your life. And these these smaller things became a bigger thing. of. Um, and then again, going back to the word and remembering that there is a future and there is a hope for me. So whatever I am going through today, it will pass. Um, and I think that's something that we don't talk about enough. You know, I think when you're in something, you really feel that this is everything. Mm. This is the beginning. This is the end. This is everything. And it's like, no, this is now. Do you know what I mean? But there will be a promise for you. There is more. Um, and I think us having this conversation right now, today, is a testimony of that. Uh, I remember one of the things that helped me get through that season of my life was being really mindful of how I speak to myself, what I was saying to myself. Um, I remember having to deliberately change my mindset from being, oh, I can't do this yep. to, you know what, maybe I can do this yep. to actually now I can do this or now it's yeah. simply I've got this. Yes. But in your case, was there anything that you used to that you used to or even still do say yeah. to yourself that helps you? It's these aff it's affirmations and it's uh once I've made an affirmation, it's then putting it into practice. So it's almost like if I allow this mood to consume me, it will. Mm -hmm. So what I am gonna do is I'm gonna be proactive right now. I'm gonna go and do something, even if everything in my being is telling me not to. I'm gonna go for a jog. Do you know what I mean? I'm gonna go to the gym. I'm gonna actually go and take my wife out for dinner. Do you know what I mean? And even though in my head there's this level of anxiety that like it's gonna be terrible. It's gonna be your mood. Your even coming here today, I was in a mood. I was just like, oh my god, I can't be bothered. Oh, but even though there's something in my head that I was like, I know as soon as we start speaking, that's all gonna go. Do you know what I mean? It's like all of these things and going. I'm not gonna allow this to defeat me. Do you know what I mean? I am bigger than this situation. I am bigger than the way that I feel. You know, I don't trust my emotions. Do you know what I mean? Uh, they're always wrong. Do you know what I mean? There's some time it's, but I'm going, I'm bigger than that. I can conquer that. Um, and it's constantly feeding that to yourself, but also having the right type of people that are around you that can know you. Do you know what I mean? Even as simple as uh, going, I ain't heard from you in a day and I know you're quite active on WhatsApp or whatever. People just check in. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I, I feel like the fellowship and, and, and brotherhood and, and having good people around you um, and being each other's keeper in a sense is, is also um, wonderful and beautiful and it's, it's yeah. one of the if there was a, if there was an action that I would want as a community after watching something like for black boys would, would, would be to check in on each other man mm. to pour that love into one another and to continue to give us reasons to live you know um, because those are the things that I consider in those dark moments what's the point do you yeah. know what I mean? What's the point? No, there were many points, man. There were many wonderful people and there are many wo uh, wonderful scenarios that I would love to see myself in still. Mm. So, uh, yeah. But what you said about how we speak to ourselves is so freaking important. Yeah. Yeah. You said something really, really beautiful just now in terms of checking in with each other to keep giving each other reasons to live. Yeah. yeah. That's such that's a. It's still like, that's something I never there. experienced in my life until what, mid 20s? Mm. Do you know what I mean? I remember. Um, there's, there's one brother in my church who um, I remember early on, he said to me, uh, like someone says to you, how are you? I'm like, yeah, I'm good, man. Mm -hmm. no, but how are you though? Yeah, I'm blessed. It was a good day. Yeah, yeah. But how are you feeling? How are you feeling? Yeah. What do you mean, how am I feeling? Mm -hmm. No one had ever asked me how. It had never been relevant to anybody up until that moment where he looked in my face and said, how are you feeling? Mm -hmm. 
I like just tears just started welling up in my face. I'm like, whoa. And I'm thinking, I don't even know if I can answer that question right now because that's 25 years of feelings that I've had bottled up. I don't even I know how to articulate that because I don't have the language to do that. There's no, there's never been any men that have been around me that have shown me how to articulate myself in that way. You know, it's very, it's easy for me to punch a wall or flip a table or, do you know what I mean? Because these kind of uh, expressions are accepted where I'm from. But to actually start sitting down and talk to you about my feelings, I don't know. I don't know, bro. Yeah. And I had f- people that I would consider friends and we knew nothing about one another, you know, because what our feelings, what, what, but men, yeah. do you know what I mean? We don't talk, yeah, do you know what I mean? So that was a pivotal moment in, in my manhood, you know, where I had to go, bro, how do I feel? And anytime anyone asks me that question from that day, you know, mm-hmm. 10 years ago, from that day, I tried to answer it as honestly as possible. And I think, <laughs> I think it overwhelms people sometimes because they're like, it's almost like, I was just saying hi, bro. <laughs> 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 but I'm like no it's a real feel it, it, it's practice for me do you know what I mean how am I feeling that? now Now you've asked me that question I have to actually engage and it's also okay for me not to be feeling great right now you know but at least I've articulated it and I, I have to reckon with it so um, yeah nice nah, it's, uh, it's so interesting man yeah. I feel like almost what you've just described at least what I heard yeah. is a, another version of what manhood could be oh hundred where it's not it's not actually the right thing to keep it inside but actually the best thing as a man is yeah. to be an example to everyone around you yes. of let's be honest yes this is what's going on yeah. and this is a space where we can actually have that exactly. conversation because exactly. it's, it's actually easier to keep it to yourself oh my goodness but then what does it do to you right yeah, that's yeah. eating up inside and and, and it, it's interesting because the majority of the time we feel like if we open up about those feelings then it makes us less of a man mm makes us effeminate do you know what I mean and it's really interesting to know that you know your brothers you know you had that conversation you all feel good now and you're still men you know yeah, like, yeah. nothing crazy happened in this process <laughs> 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 you're still brothers man do you know what I mean um, and, it, and it, it brings you closer mm. and the conversations I have with, with, with my brothers now I can never imagine do you know like yeah. the depths of those conversations and the things that we talk about and about our lives and our families and our ambitions and and we and, and we speak into one another and I'm like this this is this is what this is what that this is this can change a whole generation man mm. honestly um yeah no yeah, yeah. gonna dig on that a little bit more I don't want to go too deeply yeah, into this yeah, one yeah. but <laughs> I would love your point of view on this I've realized that when it comes to almost upholding a lot of those I guess more toxic ways of thinking of what it is to be a man yes we have a huge role in that in terms of what we do to each other and how we put each other in boxes but it's not always just men that have that no in the sense of sometimes if you chose to be open or vulnerable or whatever that might be with let's say like a a female partner or etc yeah Sometimes there can be backlashes to that too. Hundred percent, and again, that comes that comes down to the condition. And do you know what I mean? The same way that that, that conditioning works for everybody, right? Mm. So the same way that I, as a man, are condi- conditioned to be in, in any type of toxic way, then also a woman is 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 conditioned to to expect that. Exactly. Do you know what I mean? And then if her man is not giving her that and is being uh, open, honest, whoa, 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 what's that uh, about? Do you mm. mean because this isn't the, expect- the expectation that I have? Mm. And um, and it's something that uh, my wife and I make very clear. You know, we're aware that ev- that our children are seeing every single thing that we do. So, what does a healthy relationship between a man and a woman look like? Yeah, and we we understand that we present that every day. You know, when we hug, we kiss, the kids, ah, nah, 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 but you know that. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, yeah. that is that is how. Uh, a man treats a woman that he loves. Mm. This is what it feels like when a man accepts a love, love from a woman, and he's mm. still a man. This yeah. is this is how, uh, as a woman, you should be treated mm. by a man, and this is what you should accept and what you shouldn't accept. So we're, un- we're understanding that we are the first point of call for our children, not just our children, the children in our community, um, when they think about what a healthy relationship should should look like. Uh, because you know, growing up, I didn't have that, and that filtered into what I expected from a woman and and what and, and what we just spoke about, what women would expect from me, you know, and it's about how do we go back and 
and reclaim those 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 roles and those positions and hopefully that can start to filter down. Um, but there were so many women that even came to me after for black boys and were like, whoa, this has helped me understand my husband more or my partner more. And I never thought about that. And there was one lady that said uh, she got on the phone to her father straight away and she hadn't spoken to him in a while, but she was just felt that there was something, and it wasn't even specific, but something that meant that he was deeper. Mm. He was a deeper person. He was a full human being that could give her some grace in that in that relationship and that conversation she was having with him. And I was like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, man. Like first for us and then for anybody else to understand that we as men uh, and even specifically black men are fully human mm-hmm. as much as anybody else from anywhere else. Um, yeah. yeah. So true. And without a doubt, there's something I've felt that myself in the sense of, Sometimes the world doesn't see like it's seeing yeah. me for actually who I really am. Yes. It's like you can see sometimes the success, yeah. you can see yeah. my blackness, yeah. you can but I'm a full human being as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh, yeah, that's a big <laughs> that's yeah. a big part of my life. Yeah. Yeah. So, switch on lanes for a minute. Yep. So we've spoken about the the play obviously a few times, but one part we haven't really touched on is the level of the achievement that you really have had with it. So you say you've had it on a thousand, a hundred people and I'm sorry, 900 people in a single night yeah. on a consistent basis. So it's yeah. what, 800, 500 people, almost five, five, six days a week that are seeing it. We've got, so we were averaging at the moment about 800 people a night, eight days, eight shows a week. Amazing. Eight shows a week. Uh, that's just, it's been extended um, till the beginning of June. So they got four week extension. We were on last year and it's been on every year. For the last four years, yeah. So uh, a lot of people. Uh, yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's lot a lot of people. Of people. You know, last year we were up for uh, two Olivia Awards, which, you know, in terms of dreaming, mm-hmm. I, I didn't. I like to think of myself as ambitious, but I didn't even dream of being invited to the Olivier's as a nominee. You know, first being invited, but then as a nominee for best play. You know, arguably the biggest award of the night, and you're going. How did we even get here? Mm-hmm. We just wanted to tell a story. How did we even get here? Um, and then everything else that's come with that, uh, whether it's critical, you know, whether it's accolades or conversations, just so many doors and conversations that has opened up for myself and a lot of my cast and creatives that were unable, we were unable to get that access before. Um, so yeah, to say it, to say it's been life changing is probably an under understatement it really has changed everything mm. but um yeah you're, you're legitimately living the dream of so many creators that <laughs> like, like you get to you so like so many of your skills playwright yeah. director yeah writer yeah, all yeah, these yeah. different areas and you're working with theater tv yeah. etc yeah but i know there's going to be a lot of people watching this who are going to be massively inspired by you I hope so but don't know how to accomplish that for themselves i think that i, I the thing is, there's no answer to that. I think it's, for me, my starting point was always a level of self-belief mm. um, and a boldness. You know, there's never ever been a room that I've entered where I haven't been bold in it. Otherwise I won't turn up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Uh, I'm being very clear about what my outcomes of today's conversation must be. Mm. Um and when you say that, do you mean when you go to in any individual meeting? Or, yeah, for, so yeah. for instance, you know, a lot of the time, again, what I was talking about in terms of being, um, of this 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 mentality of just being um, happy to be invited. Do you know what I mean? Um, so, I'm, so I'm saying if I go into a meeting, majority of us go into a meeting and we know what we want the outcomes to be. And somewhere along the line, somewhere along the line of that meeting, we start to kind of go into ourselves and go actually... Asking for that would be crazy. Asking for that would be mad. And it's like, no, that is what I came in for. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Uh, So I am going to sit up straight and I'm going to be like, look, this is who I am. Give me this opportunity to prove who I am um, because I I believe that I can deliver on A, B and C. Mm -hmm. Uh, Which is bold, but it also comes from somewhere as well. For me, it's prayer and works, man. I'm going to pray on it, but also I'm going to put the work in. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? I'm going to work in a way that when I come to that meeting... I am confident enough to say that, not just 
because I wished, do you know what I mean? But because no, I have been working on my craft for a certain amount of times that believe that I believe that I am good enough uh, to be in a position to have this meeting and to get the outcome that I want. Um, and then obviously, if you if you get the opportunity like we did, uh, you have to show up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You have to show up. Um, and then hopefully that opens the doors for yourself, but for other creatives as well that go, yo, I know you say that you don't do well at this, but I just saw Ryan do that or for Black Bird do that. that, that. It opens up, you know. But um, for me, it was always about, yeah, a sheer kind of determination, um, clear goals uh, and things that I wanted to achieve in certain time frames. I'm not always holding myself to that because things change. Do you know what yeah. I mean? But for me, what it meant that if I said to myself, so a goal for me could be as simple as going, um, I need to finish this script by the 28th of June. Mm. I've given myself that deadline. If I don't give myself that deadline, then I'll be writing this for the next 25 years. I've given myself a deadline of goal so I know even now that this script looks like absolute mess, by the 27th, I'll have, a, I'll have something. I'll have an end product. And then from then I can give myself another deadline to get a second draft and whatnot. So I think being able to uh, put those goals and that strategy in your life and to be very clear about what you want um, helps. And making, yeah, I don't know. Do you know what? I think the way I do things is very, like you'll probably get 10 other creatives that would be like, nah, 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 nah. You know, for instance, like I, I don't have a social media profile mm -hmm. and you'll get majority of people that will tell you, you need to be on social media. We need to know who you are. Put your family, put all of this. And I'm kind of like, ah, eh, no, man. Like, I don't care about that stuff, man. You either like the work or you don't. Do you know what I mean? I don't want you to come to my show because uh, you like the new interior of my kitchen. Do you know what I mean? Because <laughs> I said some cheeky stuff online. I was like, no, I don't care, man. Like, you like it or not. So then... Um, all my attention now goes into the craft and the work, you know, and, you know, I, I want to be great at what I do, you know, Rolls Royce don't have commercials, man, they're a product, do you know what I mean, that people know that I'm going to get a certain level of quality with this, and I'm like, one day I want to be in a position where people go, they see my name and they go, I don't even know what the show's about. But I know that's a guy that if he's going to be on it, then he's going to put the work in, so it's going to be worth my time and my money. Mm. Um, yeah, so I don't have to do no funny stuff on social media. And I, <laughs> I'll be like, we need to start the show, right? I'm like, <laughs> nah, we'll do it. But um, yeah, that's just me as a person and, and going, okay, I know what I'm like. How can I, how can I find a, a model that works for me? Um, and then some people are actually have an amazing profile online and it actually helps because what they do, it needs to have that personality that goes with it. Do you know what I mean? If I was online 24 seven, man, I'm not the guy. Do you know what I'm not? <laughs> I'll be fighting everybody every second of the day. So I'm like, cool, let me find something that works for me. But, um, yeah, 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 yeah. Knowing what, knowing what it is that you're, that you're, that you're putting together and then finding the best ways to be able to, to get that out, uh, and taking chances, do you know what I mean? I think a lot of the time, you know, yes, you are an entrepreneur. If you're if you, if you're an independent artist, naturally you're an entrepreneur. Yeah. But also you are an artist. Do you know what I mean? And I think a lot of the time we think about how do we get out there? How do we sell it? And not enough time on actually making sure that that product is uh, is actually good enough to go out in the first place. So um, yeah, that finding that kind of balance is, I think, is a, is a great way to get ahead of the game. So your approach to your brand is very much so make your work so good that it speaks for itself, like really mastering your craft. But in the context of as a creative, what does it mean to work on your craft? I think for me it is to find headspace. Something I had a meeting with my agent the other day and I was like, you know, some of these writing projects, you know, I would probably do for free. They're not paying me to write. I can I can write. You're paying me to find headspace. Do you know what I mean? Uh, a safe place where I can actually put my head down and do the work, you know, you're paying me so that I don't have to pick up my phone 10 times a day to see if other work is coming through because I know that that's already secured. You're paying me to have some peace and quiet, you know. Um, it's so interesting, majority of my ideas come in the shower, you know, mm. the door's locked, no one, I don't have my phone with me, I have space and I have time and then all the thoughts are coming to my head right now. And in a busy life where you're also working, uh, you're, you're, you're an entrepreneur, you're a husband, you're a, you're a father, there's not a lot of time where you have time. Mm. So uh, that's where, in those pockets of time where I find my craft is where I, 
I look at what I want to do next and I do my research. Um, I go and I watch plays. I watch other artists. I speak to other artists. I do stuff that's nothing to do with art whatsoever because a lot of my inspirations come just from the world. Do you know what I mean? I go outside and I look at some trees and I go, oh my gosh, the way that that tree just moved in the wind is making me feel like a ballet piece. Okay, cool. I don't know much about ballet. I'm going to go watch Ballet Black tonight. Oh my days. From that... I can get inspired by anything if your if your mind is allowed to be in a space of inspiration. Um, and then once I once I have something that I want to do, then I put everything into it. Uh, it's, it's it's focus. That's what it is when it, when I think of craft. It's focus. And even just going back, I'm not bashing social media. I know it has its purpose. But when I was on it, it felt like I would be focused on something, and I'd be like, oh, everyone's gone to Ibiza okay maybe I should do that oh everyone's got all the artists are going to LA right now oh what am I missing out on oh this guy booked this thing and I didn't do it oh what and I'm like no just before you logged on you knew what you were doing today stay focused on what you're doing um and then even with like studio space so I have studio space and I grew up in Catford I have a theater in, in Catford and I have studio space there time to go into that space and to do a reading to get some actors in to play um and I'm not always thinking, I need to make a big hit. You know, actually going, no, I don't. I need to imagine. I need to play like a child again. I need to be able to try some stuff out and go, I tried that and that was crap. Do you know what I mean? Now let me try something else. And I feel like that is the part that, for me, is the most exciting part, but it's the part that a lot of people don't want to hear about the most. People want to hear about, oh, tell me about the day that you went up, uh, you went to the Olivier's. Tell me about what it was like to win that award or to be, or for the papers to talk about you in this kind of way or that, you know, it, it's, it's this kind of insta generation where everybody wants the overnight success story. They don't want to hear that actually it took me 12 years to write that. 12 years, no, no, no. Do you think you could have done it in six months? Do you know what I mean? Like, that's the kind of thing right now. And I'm like, no, man, there's actually an en enjoyment in taking my time to work on something. And I, I only want to put something out that I'm proud of. Do you know what I mean? And that takes time. And even in terms of new projects, you know, when people have seen something that you've done and they go, cool, we want to give you this money or this contract to do to do a, another version. I'm like, no, that's not actually the idea that I wanted. I've, I've done that. I've got completely different things to do right now, you know, and, and they want a, a, a turnaround. And I'm like, again, I don't work like that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go back to the craft and I'm going to go and rework on myself. And then I'm going to tell you what I want to do next because right now I don't want to know. I, I don't know what it is. And what happens to a lot of artists is you burn out creating the same, you know, you can do for black boys and then, you know, before you know it, you've done for black grandmas and you've done <laughs> for black uncles. Do you know what I mean? Because you've got, okay, this is a product that works and people are coming to it. And then me, and you're going, but I haven't used my artistic skill in any kind of way. I haven't listened to my heart in any kind of way. I haven't done something that I really wanted to do. And then even in that, working on your craft is good. then going, okay, I wrote a play about this. Now I want to write a play about aliens, but where do I even start? Okay, now I'm going to go away for a year and a half and do that research. Or I want to write a play about the 1960s or whatever. So there's a bravery in that, in, in, in going, okay, you know, the first thing that comes to your mind, not even as an artist, but as an entrepreneur, will people keep turning up now that I've changed what I wanted to do? Just having that trust that they're not just coming for the tone or the theme. Uh, they're coming because they believe in you as an artist. Um, yeah. So somewhere in that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <your answer. laughs> what, what I think I heard of that is first and foremost, yeah. knowing yourself and your heart and your desires. Yeah then it's about giving yourself that space yeah. um, to really, I guess, discover Terrigate, what it is. Exactly. Yeah. And then, but I think the underlying thing of all of that is also that psychological safety. Yeah. As an artist at the stage you are in your career now, you've created that space where you can afford to take a little bit of time out and yeah. then actually really come up with something that's deep, something that's special, something yeah. that's a, something that you're saying something new in the world. Yeah. And with your theatre company as yeah. well, you're doing that right now for other artists. Yeah. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so even just going off what you, you just said in terms of that uh, psychological safety, you know, for me, that is probably one of the biggest parts of uh, my craft and being an artist is, is being able to drown out noise. And I've had to develop that over the years. Uh, you know, when you first put something out and you want to know what everybody thinks and then it gets to the point where you're like, actually, it's probably best I don't know what everybody thinks because then that's something that I have to deal with. Uh, and... Um, and decompress. Um, 
So yeah, you know, being able to tune off and find safe space where you can tune off from the whole entire world um, helps in that in that context. But um, you know, when I started my company in uh, Nouveau Riche um, in t- 2016, it was about um, I'm very impatient as a person. So uh, if I believe that I am ready to do something, there's nobody in the world that can tell me any. any, any and a lot of the time, that's a positive. Sometimes it's not. Um, but uh, for me, I was like, how does this work? It's, you know, <laughs> how does this art thing work? So I feel like I need to be a writer. Uh, how does this work? And I'm having conversations with people and they're like, okay, cool. Well, you need a producer. You know, I've never written before. No producer's interested in me. Okay, cool. So the way my mind works is I'll be a producer then, you know? So then I take that time to go and read up on what it means to be a producer. And within a couple months, again, not knowing any really, anything about that craft other than the fact that I want to put my work on. I'm now got my producing hat on and I've got, I've put, registered my company and I have a company. I now own a company and I'm a producer, right? But what that does is it means that I can now have certain conversations and, and go in. My scripts are no longer unsolicited. Uh, I've solicited them through my own company. So now I can have certain conversations. Um, and then we put out a play called Queens of Sheba um, that went to Edinburgh and it was the first time um, we made some money. And then I was like, okay, cool. We're going to need contracts now. You know, and I remember at the time being an actor was about like tippetsing out my name in the contracts and like, I don't know what a contract was, you know what mm. I mean? But going, oh my gosh, we're in the big leagues. We made, actually made money from this. Uh, and then from then understanding that there definitely was a hole in the market or in the industry for work that felt like it existed outside of the Western canon in, a, in that kind of structure that we were all taught in school. And then uh, feeling like there was a need to make another route. You know, I, I often I often say that if I hadn't created my company, I would probably still be on a writing course somewhere. And it kind of shows that there are so little avenues in our industry to be able to platform your work. And, and uh, there's no real clear pipeline. Um, so what I did with a couple of great friends of mine is, through that company, we created a pipeline and we were, we were, we were, we were going, okay, if we only have five pound then we're going to make the best show that we can make out of five pound. And then the next show will be uh, for 500 pound and so on and so forth. Um, and that's what we've been doing for the last six years. And, you know, we've just taken a show on a tour of the U S uh, we've got for black boys in the West end. Um, and uh, we just did a tour of the UK with another show. And all of this comes from, a group of people that believe that we shouldn't have to beg for things that should naturally be for us, right? And understanding that there, there can always be another way, you know, there can always be another way. So yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's where we're at. that's where we're at. <laughs> that's where we're at. He's just looking beautiful, man. He's <laughs> looking beautiful. Honestly, you've accomplished so much. Bless you. Uh, yeah. So we're going to begin to bring us towards the end of the interview nice. now. Uh, but I do just want to say on behalf, I, actually I'm going to say this on behalf of all black men, yeah. thank you for the work that you've done. Thank, thank you for you, producing man. such a powerful and beautiful play. And like you said, in terms of that brand, whatever you put out next, yeah. there's going to be a lot of us that are just ready to, to see what you've yeah, got. Pressure, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man you, you've got this, you've got this. Thank you, thank you. The last question I ask yeah. all my guests is always, now that you've seen our podcast, you've had this experience, who do you think we should have on the show next? Um, I think I would have, if I can have two, uh, Steve McQueen, um, someone that's always fascinated me as a, as, a, as, a, as a mind, as an artist, and as someone that seems to uh, not care. You know, he, he, he really goes, this is my vision and, and I'm going to see it through. And he's become a visionary because of that, right? Uh, I would love to kind of hear more about that process in his mind. And then um, Clint, uh, a young man called Clint, who uh, has designed this streetwear brand called Cortez that uh, has really revolutionized streetwear, fashion, and even in terms of how they, they have something, I feel like a real old person now. They have something <laughs> called a drop. Uh, and my son tells me, you know, and it's like, it's like, it's all like you have to have a password to get into the site to buy the clothes. And I'm like, that would make you not want to, but it's <laughs> crazy because it's become so exclusive and we can talk about exclusive clubs as, you know, as, 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 as adults and stuff, but for a kid, you know, you need to be part of it. Basically it's branding on a completely different way and how he's contributed that to his, his craft. Um, 
and I would find that fascinating. And I'm fascinated by by these young 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 guys now. When you say it's like you're old, I know, man. <laughs> but I mean, I feel like I feel, because when I'm hearing about technology, I'm like, whoa, whoa. Um, yeah, I would I would love to hear where his inspirations came from uh, and what was his journey um, into being this uh, this young mogul now. Um, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Ryan, so much. Bless you, man. Yeah, like Anytime. I say, excited to see what happens next for you. Yeah, me too, man. <laughs> <laughs> Bless you guys.